Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Mahoney. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm a mentor with the Greater Hartford chapter of SCORE. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined today with uh, Meredith Messenger, who is the founder and CEO of InsureGood, an insurance and professional services agency located in Hartford. Uh, today, Meredith is going to be talking about beyond insurance, six major risks to avoid when scaling your business, a very important topic for every business owner, large or small. Um, so thanks for being here today. Before we jump in, I'm going to say a few words about SCORE to tell you more about what we do. Um, we're a nationwide organization of about 10,000 volunteers, and our sole mission every day is to help small business owners. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring services, workshops, and webinars like this one, and we have a variety of resources on our website to help you with all of your business needs. Uh, the best part about our services is that they're free. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about SCORE, uh, you can go to score.org, <coughs> sign up for mentoring services. We have got mentors from all walks of life and industries and area of expertise, whether it's marketing or finance or legal, uh, whatever help you need, we can pretty much find someone to help you. Um, before we jump in, uh, a few logistics. Um, the session is being recorded. We'll provide a recording of the session afterwards. And uh, we've muted everybody's microphone, but we would like to hear from you. So if you have questions or comments, you can use the chat button at the bottom of the screen to uh, share your questions and I'll keep an eye on that throughout the session. And with that, Meredith, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and I will second the uh, value of SCORE. I'm actually a SCORE client, which is how I came across this opportunity. Um, so I encourage everyone to reach out to SCORE for whatever your small business needs, because um, as we said in the beginning, SCORE has a wide variety of, of um, expertise and experts and tools uh, that you guys can leverage. So just a little plug for SCORE. Um, so good morning. My name is Meredith Messenger. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, I'm the founder and CEO of InsureGood. InsureGood is a professional services and insurance firm based out of Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, we help CEOs and scaling small business owners um, identify and avoid hidden risks and recognize growth opportunities. So really what we do is we pair a deep understanding of small business that we've built up over many years of small business consulting and small business ownership with our insurance and risk management expertise, allowing us to help you as small business owners really navigate the risks that you face as you scale. Um, and specifically, we focus on the areas of um, finance, operations, insurance, and human resources. Uh, we provide a variety of plug and play tools and resources as well as consulting and insurance services to really give you a holistic um, risk uh, portfolio, risk navigation portfolio. Uh, the other big important component of our company is our charitable arm. So we do have a charitable organization attached to us where we uh, put 20% of our profit uh, into a special fund that's dedicated to um, aspiring female entrepreneurs and scaling female entrepreneurs. Um, so we dedicate to that, that to them in the form of uh, capital, education, mentorship, um, and different opportunities. So really, truly, we are a community-based organization. Uh, and so when people work with us, they're actually working with our entire community here in the greater Hartford area. So that's something we're very, very proud of. Today, we're going to talk about risk. And risk is not uh, <laughs> a popular topic. It's not something that people love. When they hear the word, they tend to cringe a little bit. Um, but I'm hopeful that through today's presentation, we can talk about the value of risk. We can talk about how risk can be uh, managed and in certain situations controlled, and how you can implement a framework for approaching not only the risks that you're certain to face in your small business, but also the decisions that you're going to be required to make time and time again, decisions that can impact the future of your business and your own personal future. So you should be able to walk away today with a nice framework and an appreciation for how you can more comfortably navigate risk as you grow your business. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, if you're scaling a business, if you're unclear um, on where to focus your attention and what needs to be done, which is a very common problem as you're scaling a business, if you're feeling anxious about the potential problems you may face as you grow and evolve in your organization, if you're unsure how to evaluate choices that you need to make and how to move forward, and if you feel uncertain about the foundation of your business, the piece of your business that really needs to be strong in order for you not only to um, 
launch and be successful in the first five years, but to create a sustainable business. Risk management can provide you with a framework that lowers the chance of business failure. I mean, we all hear about how, I don't know, 40 to 60% of all businesses are going to fail in the first five years, right? And even more are going to fail within the first 10 years. Um, risk management can really help you beat those odds. It can help you improve your bottom line, lower your expenses, create efficiencies throughout your business. It can provide a framework for prioritization. What should you be working on and when in your business? Obviously, it's going to help create a healthier, sustainable business, as we talked about. And really, it's going to help reduce the stress and anxiety that is associated with the unknown, the what if, the things that keep you up at night as a business owner. And I know um, they've kept me up at night many times. Risk management, management can really help you minimize that stress and that anxiety you feel as you're kind of moving through uh, phases of your business that you're less familiar with, maybe you're less comfortable with. Um, so risk management can be a really valuable tool to any business owner of any size. And traditionally, we've thought of risk management as more of a larger business um, activity. But really, what we're talking about today is how you can use risk management at any stage of your business, in particular, as you scale. So I'm hopeful that um, this will give you guys a little bit of relief from that stress and anxiety. Uh, before we jump right into risk management, I just kind of want to do a little bit of a table stakes conversation here and talk about what risk really is, right? So risk is inherent in everything that we do. The fact that you're on this webinar today or that you're watching it, that's a risk, right? Because going on your computer puts you at risk for some sort of cyber hack, right? Or some sort of issue that you could have. Um, the decision that you made to get in your car, maybe get a coffee or pick up your children, that's a risk. We're dealing with risks all the time in our personal lives and our business lives. And most times, it's a subconscious thing where we're, weigh, we're weighing the risk and reward um, subconsciously and saying, okay, so this is a risk, but I feel comfortable doing it because I can wear my seatbelt when I get in the car, or I know that my car is safe, right? So that's all happening in the background often, um, many, many times a day when we make decisions to do things. But when we're working through our business, leaving risks uh, to be dealt with, with gut feelings and in the moment um, decisions is very, very um, it, it's very risky, for lack of a better term. It creates opportunities for surprises in your business and in your life that can be catastrophic. So we really want to think about risk as something that we can consciously contemplate and something that we can consciously plan for. It, risk tends to be an emotional topic for a lot of people. Risk is dynamic, meaning it's always changing, and in particular in your business, right? The market is one way one day. It may be completely different another day. Your business is at one stage at this point. A year from now or two years from now, it's going to be at a completely different stage, right? So the risks that you face at any given point in time are changing. So we need to think of risk as a, a constant um, business issue, a constant business component that we need to consciously deal with. Um, Risk can be internal or external. And I think a lot of times when I'm working with clients for the first time, they bring up a lot of external risks. So the risk of competition moving into the neighborhood, the risk of a market changing or your, um, uh, your interest rates changing, right? So those are all external risks. Those are things that can happen that generally we have very little control over, but we may be able to plan for. Um, internal risks are inherent to our business and how we operate it. Oftentimes, they're things that we do have control over. They're things that we can plan for. But those internal risks are oftentimes just inherent in running a business. So they need to be acknowledged. They need to be recognized. And then they need to be managed. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. The other thing about risk is, as I said in the beginning, it tends to be an emotional topic. It's highly personal and individualized. And what I mean by that is, um, how Meredith feels about risk is going to be very different than how maybe, you know, Amanda feels about risk because our experiences and our disposition to risk are very different. So one person may be very risk adverse. Another person may look at risk and say, I see far more reward than I do risk. So just know that your approach and your attitude towards risk does play a factor in how you manage it in your business. Um, especially if you have multiple people on your management team or multiple partners, and there's a difference between how each of you um, views risk. So there could be some uh, constructive conflict there, right? Risk is also individualized, meaning um, 
it's situational, right? Some businesses are capable of taking on more or different types of risks, and some businesses aren't, which we'll talk about in a second. But the big point on this, on, on this slide around risk is really that we all need to acknowledge that risk is inherently linked to reward. So if you're in a position in a mindset of where you wanna avoid all risk, you're actually doing yourself a disservice because you are dismissing what may be really important and rewarding opportunities in your business um, because you are only looking at the risks or the, yeah, the negative risk side of things, right? So when you're thinking about risk, it's really important that you start thinking about the reward side of it. All business owners, all successful entrepreneurs, all successful businesses that have grown over time have faced risk and have chosen to move forward despite the risk. The fact that you're even in business today means that you valued the reward of starting the business over the risk of starting the business. So I like to remind people that just because you see a risk doesn't mean you should stop there. Sometimes you need to continue the conversation and say, okay, I see all these risks that are associated with this decision or this situation. Um, let me look for all of the rewards that may also be associated with this, this situation. And then you need to do an analysis. Okay, which over which is more important to you in the situation? And are you able to manage the risky side of that decision to reap the reward side of the decision? So just keep in mind that all risks and rewards are related. So risks in and of themselves aren't inherently bad. It's just when they surprise you, it's when you don't plan for them or you're not aware of them. I just like to say that because I know a lot of people have a negative connotation over risk. So what is risk management exactly? I like to talk about risk management as prevention through preparation. As I just said in the last slide, really it's about not being surprised by what may come or what eventually will come in your business. It's a systematic approach to controlling, to the extent that's possible, the future outcomes um, in your business by acting proactively rather, rather than reactively. So things are far less scary far less disruptive and far less financially devastating when we plan for them and we have um, prevention and mitigation uh, procedures in place, right? So if we're systematically going through our business and reviewing where the risks lie and then having a plan in place to address them, it's far less likely to have a business ending or catastrophic effect on um, on us if and when they do happen, right? So we lower the chance of the risk happening and we also lower the chances of the risk being um, completely devastating, all right? So lowering the impact of the risk. Um, it's a framework that you can use to systematically identify and prioritize and address the many risks and decisions that you're gonna have to make as a business owner, as we talked about in the beginning. So risk management isn't just about insurance or it's not just about figuring out what might happen to your business. It's about identifying, making part, making it part of your business culture to identify things that are working and things that aren't working, things that are putting, uh, potentially putting your business at risk and then putting plans in place to address those things. Um, so we're gonna jump into that framework right now so that you guys have a sense of kind of how the whole thing works. Um, before I do that, I'm just gonna check in really quickly. Does anybody have any questions to this point or anything that they wanna talk about when it comes to risk or risks that they face in their business? that we can specifically address in the presentation. And if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, you can put them in the chat box and we can uh, we can get those to Meredith. Yeah. And Not at any point in time. Yet. Okay, at any point in time, you at guys can have questions. Yep. Okay, all right. So we talked about sort of the fundamental components of risk, the mindset issues around risk. Um, and then we talked at a high level about risk, what risk management is. Now I wanna jump into what the actual framework of risk management looks like. So the first thing that all businesses need to do, and really on a regular basis, but certainly initially, is understand what your overall risk tolerance is. And what I mean by that is how much and how much risk are you willing to take with your business and in what areas, right? And there are certain things that impact that. The industry that you work in is a big one, right? So if you're working in a highly regulated industry, um, you oftentimes have to have a very small tolerance for risk. So banks, insurance agencies, things of that nature, um, they have regulations in place to make sure that they're not taking risks, right? Uh, large risks. 
Um, whereas maybe if you're running a bakery, your risk tolerance might be a little different in certain areas. So you really need to think about both your personal preference around risk, like how you feel about it um, and how much you're willing to sort of absorb what your industry um, regulations say around risk and how you manage risk there. And also capital, right? Because some amount of risk carries financial consequences if, if those risks were to be recognized, right? So how much capital do you have in place to potentially address the financial impacts of a risk gone awry, let's say, right? And all those factors are going to contribute to what your business and your personal risk tolerance is. And once you have a sense of that, um, you're going to go into the exercise, which is where we're going to focus uh, most of our time today is in these next three steps. Um, you're going to go into the process of identifying your risks. And so you're going to systematically work through the different components of your business and identify where your unique risks sit. Okay. And there's a process for that. Once you've identified those risks, you're going to start assessing them. And to assess them, you categorize and prioritize them. And we're going to talk about kind of what that formula looks like, a very simple way of doing this. Um, and once you have categorize and prioritize them, then you're going to go into sort of brainstorming around how you control those risks, to what extent you can control those risks, and what things you can put in place to help lower the probability of them occur occurring. And then lastly, once you have those um, processes and procedures in place and those ideas in place around how you're going to control risk, you need to constantly go back and reevaluate if that's working. Um, risk management needs to be a part of your overall business planning process. So it's not a set it and forget it type of activity. Uh, as we described in the beginning, risk is dynamic and is always changing the same way your business and the market and the world is always changing. So it does need to be a part of your culture and a part of your business planning process. So uh, typically I advise uh, my clients to go back through the risk planning process at a high level quarterly. And then when we're planning for the next year, go into a real deep dive around risk analysis. So it's an ongoing living, breathing document. You, it's not a set it and forget it thing. Um, and I think that's one thing that uh, gets lost sometimes in the shuffle of just regular business, but you need to consider it a, fun, a fundamental part of your business planning process. Whether you, you know, do one, go ahead. And I was going to say, just, just to, just to chime in there, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you're saying. You know, I have this conversation with clients sometimes, and a lot of times risk evaluation is one of those things that's always on the list, but you never get to it. But I, I, I give them the same advice and I've done this in my own career companies I've worked at is make it part of your business planning process. You do that process formally once a year, make it a component of that. You'll set aside the time to do it. And it's a great time too to do a refresh of your business, the market, the competition, your, you know, risks internal and external. It's, it's great advice. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you can see the difference in a business that's aware of these risks and actively sort of managing them versus a business who's uh, pro or uh, reacting to the things that are happening in their business and with almost a sense of panic. Right. And I think making this part of your culture and lowering the ability for a surprise has a really dramatic impact on the overall success of the business and just the day-to-day -day stress levels um, and the challenges that they face because there's a plan in place. So yeah, for sure. Um, so these are the four steps. Most uh, risk management professionals really only identify like the first three or four. I think it's really critical that you understand your risk tolerance too and where you are in your business life cycle. So uh, it's a really important piece of how you're gonna approach risk now and in the future. Okay. So now let's talk about identifying risks. So there are various different ways that you can go about identifying where you need to focus your attention strategically on risk throughout your business. And where I think it makes sense to start is really breaking the risk down into buckets, types, right? So you can kind of systematically make sure you're working through your business. Another approach is to look at it from a top-down perspective. So you can identify your key processes that are critical to the operation of your business and you can work from a process level down. So there's just two different approaches to risk management. I do both, okay? So let's start with looking at the main buckets of risk that a scaling small business is gonna face. So at the very top, you have what's obvious, which is strategic risk. 
strategic risks are the types of decisions that you make when you're forming your business strategy, the direction, the future of your company. It's kind of like when there's a fork in the road, do you go left or do you go right? And what impact might that have on your business? Some really uh, famous examples of this are, are Kodak. If you guys remember Kodak, they had the opportunity to transition into more of a digital based company, right? Like with the digital photography and really embrace what at the time was emerging technologies, right? They did not make that strategic decision and that really hurt them in the long run. That's an example of sort of a strategic risk, right? But it can go the other way too. If you think about Microsoft, um, Microsoft was a computer company and I forget, it was like 2000 or something. They introduced Xbox. And everybody thought that that was a silly decision because PlayStation had a hold on the gaming world, right? But now, if you look back on it, Xbox totally changed Microsoft as a company. It opened up a ton of new doors, right? So that was an example of a strategic risk that they took that worked really well for their company. So strategic risks are probably the foundation of the things that you're gonna be working on in your business. Um, the second risk, types of risk that your business face, faces is legal and compliance risks. And they both sound really scary. I don't know if anyone who's worked in corporate America, there's two teams that you don't really wanna be involved in. Like you don't want them to call you in. It's the legal team and the compliance team, right? So as small business owners, I think legal and compliance sounds scary. Um, legal and compliance revolve around the laws and the regulations and the contracts that you have in place um, as a business owner, right? So you think about things like what type of entity are you? Uh, and, and I know that sounds like a silly question, but the type of entity that, that you are um, opens you up or closes you off to different types of risks, right? So sole proprietors face very different risks than an LLC does. They also face different compliance requirements. So I'll give you guys an example. I was working with a client who operated in like 20 states. It was an insurance agency and they wrote business in 20 states. Um, they hadn't realized that they were supposed to file um, their, their annual reports in other states that they weren't domiciled in. That means they also didn't file their taxes in those states. So that caused a huge impact to their overall business because they weren't in good standing in like 15 different states, right? So that impacted their ability to operate and their ability to expand into other states. That was like a $50,000 plus legal expense mistake. You have to go back, you have to fix all the taxes, you have to, so that compliance risk is an important one to be aware of. Um, and of course, that's gonna vary too, depending on your industry. It's gonna vary depending on the, as I said, the type of entity that you are, if you're an LLC or a corporation. Um, and it's also gonna vary depending on your location. So I've seen other businesses that were um, approaching international work and not really having a good understanding of the laws and regulations of the new countries that they were expanding into. That could be devastating to them. So compliance risk isn't fun, but it's a fundamental piece of business that we need to make sure we're keeping an eye on. Um, the next one is reputational risk. So reputational risk is anything that impacts how people, the public, clients, the business world um, views your company. And, and I think a lot of times people think of reputational risk as um, one big event. So like a good example of that would be Uber in 2018 with their sexual harassment claims. Um, that ended up costing them $20 million plus all of the issues that they had operationally having to fire and hire and rebuild and all of that lost, lost income in that process. Um, but reputational risks at a small business level are also a lot about just Google reviews. What are people saying about you online? What are your people saying online? Um, and that's a huge new emerging risk. So if you have teams and they're out there on social media, especially in venues like LinkedIn, where your company name is branded with them, what they're saying can have an impact on your business. Um, your ability to fulfill your contracts, your a lawsuit, a um, product recall, all of these things can pose a huge reputational risk. Okay, so reputational risk is anything that impacts you financially based on the loss of goodwill and um, strong reputation. Financial risks are just as they would sound. It revolves around the amount of uh, money you have coming in and the amount of money you have going out and the things that may impact that. So you think about issues like a heavy concentration of your revenue coming from one client. 
if they default on payment or something happens to them economically, right? So a lack of diversification in your client base. Um, you think about things like having a heavy debt load. And we talked about interest rates changing. Short-term debt is very challenging for a scaling, scaling small business to deal with. So if you're not ready for that, that could be hugely impactful in your business. Um, other things have to do with like a, a client receivables, not getting paid on time. So there's a variety of things that go into financial risk, but really it's anything that impacts your cash flow and your financial solvency. Um, and examples of that are things like Enron, which is you know hugely controversial, but that was a at its core, that was a debt load issue, right? Uh, Lehman Brothers, same thing. That's an accounting issue. Again, controversial, but but those were the core issues that were going on in those businesses that caused them to fail. Um, number five is pink because it's really, in my mind, one of the only ones that you don't have control over. Like you don't, you cannot impact it at all, which is environmental threats, right? So those are things like we talked about in the beginning, things that come from outside of your business, but could have a hugely impact, a huge impact in your business, right? The most relevant one right now is COVID. So that's an external threat and an external opportunity, depending on how you're looking at it and what you've done, um, that we couldn't have controlled. There was nothing that any of us were going to do to control COVID. Um, there were things that we could do to be prepared for a downturn, but COVID itself, like there was nothing we were going to do to stop it, right? Um, another example of that would be like the downturn of 2007. Uh, that's an economic impact. Uh, technology plays a huge role in environmental threats. So for those of us who operate in businesses that like professional services or that revolve around people and their expertise, a lot of that's being threatened by technology, right? And we've seen that. We saw that with the real estate industry. We're seeing it with paraprofessional, uh, not paraprofessionals, uh, <laughs> what are legal, the, the legal assistants, right? Um, so they're, they're starting to be sort of overtaken by technology. So all of these different things can threaten what we're doing today and how we're doing it, right? So the best thing you could do with an environmental risk is be aware of it and have an idea of how you wanna pivot, have an idea of financially what the impact might be and be prepared if it were to happen, right? So you have to stay um, abreast of what's going on in the economy, locally, nationally, internationally. You have to be aware of what's going on in your industry so that you can navigate these things as they come up. So they're not as big of a surprise, right? And then number six, which is my personal favorite, everybody knows I work on ops, um, is operational risk. And I like operational risk the best because you have so much influence on all of the other areas outside of environmental. Um, operational enhancements can lower the risk in almost every single area. So process and people, can help you lower the risks in all these other areas. Now, they can also hurt you. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's completely within your control. Your operational risks are things that you can manage. I see that there's a question. I'm just gonna pause for a second. All right, there is a question. Um, oh, they're just looking for a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. Yes, we will take care of that. Um, but Meredith, while we're at a break here, you mentioned earlier that when uh, businesses are evaluating risks, that they tend to go more towards the external risks and not the internal risks. Is it the people and processes that you're talking about that they yes. may not think of for it? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And when we think about people too, and we're going to break down operational risk in just a second, but when we think about people, um, I want you all to think about the holistic view of people. So not just people that you hire that you're responsible for necessarily, but contractors. Third-party contractors are one of the fastest growing sources of risk in a business right now. Um, so you're responsible for the work of your contractors. I know um, from an operational perspective in a scaling business, it makes a lot of sense to outsource a lot of things. And it can be hugely beneficial, but it's also risky. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You just need to plan for it and have the right controls in place, right? Um, so when we're talking about operational risk, we're talking about um, things like your facilities and your physical assets. So where do you operate? Property, right? Like what property do you own? What machinery or key tools do you need in, uh, in order to keep your business going and keep generating revenue? Uh, we're talking about client experience and quality issues. 
So what are all of the processes and things that go into creating a successful client experience consistently over time? Um, and QA, uh, QA, quality assurance, what types of things you have in place to ensure the products you're putting out there, be them physical products or your consulting product, your mental products, whatever it is you're delivering to the world, what's your process for making sure that it's delivered uh, to the satisfaction of the clients consistently over time? Uh, where operational risks also include things like IT disruptions. So right now, probably the most pressing issue, the most famous thing is cyber hacks, right? Cyber um, incidents, ransom, data, data issues, data privacy. All of those things are very um, in the forefront right now. They're very threatening. Like, it's been a very hostile environment, right? Especially since the pandemic. Uh, in, internal and external fraud. So believe it or not, fraud and theft actually account for, um, they're actually the second highest loss that a business faces, like statistically speaking. So you think about things like credit card skimming. You think about things like uh, accountants, bookkeepers skimming money. There's a lot of fraud, uh, a lot of activities that go into the fraud and theft category. And some of the most common are actually employee theft because they have access to systems, they're put in positions where they're handling different types of funds and things like that. So uh, internal and external uh, fraud and threat are high risk um, on the operational side. And then lastly, the last two are really employment practices and workplace safety. So one of the fastest rising areas of concern for a small business are employee lawsuits, being sued for sexual harassment, being sued for um, hostile work environments. Some of that has to do with gender identity issues, a variety of things, but employee liability issues um, are rising at an alarming rate. So you have those employment practices issues. Um, and then you also have just like, how do you manage people? Like, how do you make them effective? How do you, how do you help create a culture and an environment that retains your talent, helps them be productive and buys into your overall mission and value statement, right? So it's not just problems. Sometimes it's about creating a culture for success too. Um, and then we talked about workplace safety a little bit, but last on the list of operational risks are client and vendor risks. So that kind of hits back on the idea of, do you have diversification within your supply chain or are you overly reliant on one vendor that in order to do your job, that if they were to fail or have a delay or have an issue, would completely devastate your cash flow. That's an important thing to focus on. Um, you can also have an over reliance on a person in your business, and I see this a lot with small businesses. And what I mean by that is, you have a key person. They're awesome. They do all the things in their area, and nobody else knows how to do them. What happens if they leave? I see this a lot with small businesses. And then the owners aren't even really sure what they were doing. <laughs> like they don't know how to do that job. So, you know, hiring for another person becomes really challenging because you don't have a sense of how to do it. These are all things that we need to think about as we're, you know, working our way through what risks do our business face. Over-reliance on people, over-reliance on particular clients, over-reliance on particular vendors, they all create a risk for you. Um, those are the buckets, the six buckets that, I work through with clients as we're evaluating the risks. And again, one of the ways to do that is for each of these six categories, really identify what your key processes are in each of the six buckets. So financial, for instance, maybe how do I, how do we handle bookkeeping? Are we invoicing on time? What are the different processes that are going on in each of these buckets that need to be addressed in order for us to continue to function well, right? And then what risks do we face with each of those processes? Um, another thing, especially for a scaling small business who maybe doesn't have um, the perspective of seeing other businesses or even the time in their own business, would be to identify common risks in your industry. So if you're a restaurateur, you're going to have a particular set of risks that are unique to your industry, and you can benchmark yourself against them. Okay, so go to your industry associations. Those can be really helpful if you don't have a lot of context in your own business yet find your areas of expertise and then identify too with them, you can have help, um, what some of the common risks are there. So like, as an example, um, right now it's very clear restaurants are have facing a, a staffing shortage, right? So if you're opening a restaurant right now, you need to think ahead of time or running a restaurant, you need to think about your benefits package, your culture, 
what your talent acquisition strategy is, right? And I know that sounds fancy, but it is something that we all have to think about. Where are we going to get people and why do they want to work for us? Um, and every industry has their own common risk. So that's another way of approaching this, right? Maybe you haven't seen that risk yet, but someone in your industry has. Okay, so those are the types of risk. And I went, there was a lot in there. So I want to, again, pause and see, does anybody have any questions? Can I go deeper in, in, in any of these buckets for you guys? No, nope? not okay. seeing anything right now. Okay. All right. So those are all of the different types of risks and how you should approach identifying them. Once you've identified them, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to rate them. And it's easy. This seems like a complex process, but it's really not. All you need to do is categorize and prioritize these. And you're going to categorize them by um, severity and frequency. So how likely is it for one of these losses to happen? Are you, is it happening currently? Then it's pretty likely it's going to happen, right? Um, has it never happened, but could it happen? Okay, so maybe we'll rate that a little bit lower, right? Once you decide how likely an event is to happen in your business, a risk is to like to realize this risk, then you're going to want to say, okay, if it were to happen or when it does happen, how impactful is it going to be financially to my business? So that's where we're looking at here. Um, on the left-hand side, we're looking at how detrimental it would be to our business financially. And on the top here, we're looking at how likely is it to occur? So the intersection of those two things is going to dictate what level of priority it gets from you, because clearly you are not going to be able to address every risk in the moment. And you don't need to. That's stressful. Most of these things we can, we can rate and we can say, okay, that can wait. I have a high enough tolerance to handle my computer system being down for a day. So I'm not going to worry about building 17 redund redundancies in, in this area, right? Because it would be mildly impactful to my business. However, when I look up here, these are things that could destroy my business. There are things that are very likely to happen or they are happening. And there are things that would have an extreme financial impact if they continue to happen. This is where we wanna to start to focus our time, right? In this upper right-hand area here where the intersection of certain and severe. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's okay. It might look scary to you at first because I know it sometimes it could be like kind of jarring to look at these things. But again, you could form a plan for them when you know about them, okay? This is called a risk map. And it's an activity that I do with almost every client I have. I just sit down and we do a brainstorm. Um, we compare it to industry trends. We compare to past experiences. We list all of the things and then we put them into a risk map. And the things that fall down here, we're not as concerned with. The things that fall in here, we need to get to at some point, but the things that are up here, we better plan for now. Does that make sense? You know, Meredith, this, this tool that you're using, this, this risk map, I love it. I've, I've talked to clients about this concept of uh, likely, likelihood or impact in, mm -hmm. and rating things high to low. And because I think it really helps. You could really scare yourself if you start rattling off 25 mm -hmm. risks and saying, oh my God, what do I do? But if you focus on the five that are going to really move the needle in that upper right quadrant, I mean, that just really, you can execute on those and mitigate those as best mm -hmm. you can. Yeah. Um, we, we did have a question come in about um, kind of a, an industry risk here. Um, um, I don't know if you can, you can opine on this, but maybe any experience you've seen is, what do you think about getting into the cannabis business as a risk? Uh, this person's thinking about getting into a, uh, a cannabis massage spa. So I don't know if you talk to clients mm -hmm. about different industry risks. Well, I do. And the cannabis one is a whole new thing, though. So I'm not going to um, say I'm an expert in this in this field. I think your biggest risk right now is going to be regulatory. So the idea of how the state is going to embrace that risk and then like what the future of it's going to look like and what regulations you're going to be held to, I think is probably the biggest thing if this is what you're thinking of doing. Um, but there are consultants who work in that area. So there's a whole array of support services that are popping up for the cannabis industry that um, can probably help you. And I can certainly do some research there. Um, one other thing I would mention is there are gonna be pieces of your cannabis business that are insurable. There are gonna be pieces that are not. So you're gonna to have to plan for uh, financial contingencies in there. 
So you're gonna have to have some money in an operating fund for losses that are not insurable yet. They will be someday. The insurance companies just take a really long time to catch up to like what's actually going on in the real world. Um, so eventually they'll be insurable, but not you will not have the same level of protection right out of the gate that other businesses do in terms of insurable risk. Does that, does that help? Do you have any follow-up questions? I uh, just said, okay, thank you. So I think we're good. Okay. Anything else before I move on? Uh, I'm not seeing anything right now. Okay. All right. So if you've kind of followed along here, what we've done is we figured out, are we okay? Are, how do we feel about certain types of risks? So we've developed a risk tolerance. Um, we've talked about a process for identifying where those buckets or what those buckets of risk are and where our risks sit in those individual buckets, right? And then we moved on to the assessment piece where we're categorizing and prioritizing risk so that we're not freaking ourselves out and we're not all overwhelmed with risk, but we're also not like an ostrich where we're not acknowledging any risk, right? So we've tried to find a comfortable ground and a repeatable way to think about decisions and risks in our business. So now the logical thing to do from here is to come up with a plan, right? So in terms of controlling risk, normal risk advisors have four ways. Me being extra, I have five. Um, and the fifth one really isn't a method for controlling risk, but it's really important to us as small business owners. So um, when we recognize a risk, we can use one or a combination of different methods to help minimize the risk that we're facing, right? So one is acceptance. You may say, okay, I've looked at this and the reward outweighs the risks associated with it, or I really think that the risk or the, the reward here is important and I can help lower the risk in another fashion, right? I can use another method to lower that risk, but I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna accept some or all of that risk, okay? Another way that you can manage the risk or deal with it is transferring it to another person, another party, getting it out of your way, right? Um, and you can transfer some, again, or all of it. So examples of transferring risk are going to be insurance, which is obvious. So that's a contractual obligation between you and the insurer um, where they're going to provide financial protection for certain things that happen in your business. You can also have contractual transfers, which are really important for small business owners. And alarmingly, I see a huge problem in small businesses where they don't have the right contracts in place. I'm not a legal expert, but there are certain areas of your business that 100% require you to have solid contracts in place to limit the liability that's going to come back to you as the business owner. So an example of that is a terms and services agreement a hold harmless agreement, an indemnity agreement. These are all things that your risk manager insurance person and your attorney should, should be advising you on. So as an example of that, um, I work with a client who um, works with chefs and then delivery people. It's a food delivery system. This person needs to have contracts in place between her drivers, even though they're contractors and herself that dictate whatever happens in the delivery of the food, um, they are going to hold her harmless from. That means they are not going to hold her liable or her business liable to what happens um, in their activities as, as independent drivers. Critical, critical contractual risk transfer piece. Um, if that's not there and say they get in an accident and they don't have the proper insurance and they get sued by whoever they hit, that lawsuit could go all the way up to the business owner. So contractual risk transfer is really important. You need to have the right contracts in place. In fact, some of your insurance carriers will require you to have these contracts in place or they will not insure you, okay? But this is a critical thing that I see a lot of small business owners skip over or miss or don't really understand that they need. That's important. Um, the third way you can help uh, control or mitigate your risks is reduction. And we're gonna talk a lot about that in a second. But there are preventative measures that you can put in place that either lower the likelihood of the negative risk occurring or lower the impact that the risk has when it does occur, okay? You can avoid or you can eliminate it. 
you could say, I, this is too much for me. I'm not going to do it. Maybe I'm not going to roll out this new product. I think it's too risky to my core product line. I'm going to eliminate that risk altogether. Um, maybe you choose not to expand your operations into a new location. Too much risk, right? Um, for a variety of ways, but you can avoid it or you can eliminate it sometimes, depending on what it is. Um, you can't avoid operational risk. Just being in business means you're going to face an operational risk. So that's one thing that I, I think people do get caught up on sometimes. And then the fifth thing here, again, is not really a risk control um, method, but it's critical. You have to have your squad. Like you have to have an expert team of people that can help support your business. Score is a great avenue for that, but you also need a lawyer. You need a lawyer that you work with that you know and that knows your business. I know there are other options out there that are cost effective and it's better than nothing, like a legal shield. Those are good things to have if, if cash flow is an issue, but you need a lawyer. And it really should be someone who understands your business, who knows you personally, that you can pick up the phone and call. Uh, you need an accountant. I see a lot of people trying to operate without accountants. You need a really good risk manager or insurance person. These are all people that work together to help form a bubble around you and your business so that in the event that something does happen, which it will happen because every year, one out of four small businesses get sued. Um, but these are all people who can form a bubble around your business and help protect it from catastrophic impact potentially, right? They work together to form a team that can protect your business. All of them work together. So you really do need that advisory team. And I'm going to throw in there too, an, uh, a business strategy advisor. For most of us, we're working through businesses that and put in situations that we've never been in before. So when we're faced with making critical decisions, it's sometimes hard to make the best decision when you're thinking on your own. If you can find yourself a really good advisor, whether it's through SCORE or you know, a, a consultant or whomever that knows your industry, I highly recommend that you do that because working in isolation, it's not good for you, but it's also not the best impact, um, outcome, right? In order to increase your outcomes, you need to have someone who's been through something like this before. Um, okay, so those are the ways to control risk. I'm gonna pause for a second because I, I think somebody may have asked a question, but I'm not sure. Yeah, we did have a few questions come in. Um, one person asked about a mental health coaching business. Um, and uh, another person asked about a data collection service. Um, and trying to understand potential risks I could have as a sole proprietor doing business as a, as a, a data collection service. Yeah, so um, I'm not a legal person, but there are advantages of moving out of sole proprietorship, sole proprietorship and into an LLC, namely, there is a protective bubble, a protective barrier that forms between you and the liability, like your personal assets, like your home, your car, your bank account, all that stuff, um, that forms to protect it from your business. So if you were to be sued in your business, like say your data collection person, so say that you are working on a project for a client and you are working from home and your um, system gets hacked, Maybe, maybe oh, you fall for a phishing scam, which is very common right now. It's <laughs> super, super common. You click on something you're not supposed to click on and all of a sudden they're skimming personal data from your clients, right? Um, if you were to be sued for that, because it's hugely costly to have a data breach, um, it could cost $500 per record stolen, literally, um, you may, be vulnerable, your personal assets may be vulnerable in that lawsuit. So the business entity is something you need to talk to a lawyer about, but the business entity is important in terms of protecting your personal assets. Um, and the risks associated with the data collection agency have a lot to do with your technology and the type of data that you're storing um, and the type of cybersecurity that you have in place. So that's like, when I hear that, that makes my ears burn a little bit because technology right now and cybersecurity is such a big deal. Um, so at a minimum, I, I would definitely address that risk if I were you, but you also have a liability exposure, professional liability exposure because you are providing services to another business. So we need to think about that. Um, you know, what that process looks like, what your QA, you know, looks like, how are your contracts set up? Um, because a lot of times the 
litigation lawsuits that happen between consultants and service providers and their clients have to do with contractual obligations that weren't met. 80% of the time, a client's upset because they feel you didn't fulfill your duty or your obligation to the contract. Maybe you didn't hit a timeline. Uh, maybe advice that you gave them caused them, they feel caused them financial loss. Even if those things aren't true, you still have to pay to defend yourself. Uh, which can be very, very expensive. So it could cost $100,000 to you know, have a lawyer, hire a lawyer to defend you. You go to court and it could get dismissed because it's a meaningless lawsuit. Anybody could sue you over anything. Um, so those are the types of things that you're going to want to be thinking about. Professional liability risk, contractual risk, cyber liability risk. Um, and without knowing all of your business, those are just the big things that come to mind. So work with a lawyer on your, your, on your contracts. Yeah, great, great advice. Um, Meredith, we have another question. Um, individual asked about a mental health coach, coaching business, uh, mainly online coaching and art therapy, and had a comment in here about always having a hard time identifying risks. I was thinking through this as well. We talked about the brainstorming idea, looking at top down, bottoms up. Um, how about for folks who are just kind of wondering, A, you know, the question about the specific business, but just wondering, where do I think, how do I brainstorm? How do I think through an inventory of risks for my business? Yeah. Um, so again, I like to look at it in buckets of business operations. So we showed you in the beginning, if I go just go back a couple slides, let's look at this. So I like to look at it this way. Um, and this is the kind of conversation I have with my clients, right? Not something I can necessarily solve in this webinar, but it, just to give you an idea. So when you think about these buckets, you need to think about it as an industry, like what are the risks in your industry and what are the risks to you specifically as a business? And again, those are going to change. I don't know whether you're thinking of starting it, haven't yet started it or, or growing it, you know, that sort of thing. Those all kind of play, have an impact on this. But uh, when you're starting to brainstorm, I want you to think about, okay, and especially for things that are in health, any kind of health, right? What are the regulatory and what's the word I'm looking for? Um, licensing requirements, right? So what are all of the professional designations and licensing requirements that I have um, that I need to have or that I should have for this? So I see one of the things I see happening a lot is I see people registering as health coaches who don't have health coaching backgrounds or the opposite RNs who are registering as like holistic health coaches. Both of them are problematic in that you have one that's coming into an industry that doesn't really have the uh, in the, the background, right? So there's a risk. You're advising someone on health issues without necessarily a health background. That, that could be a real big problem. Um, and you need to think about that. You need to think about what licensing you need, what uh, experience and background should you have. If you don't have those things, you're not going to be able to get insurance. If you don't have insurance and you offer one person one piece of advice that they say made them sick, you are extremely vulnerable. So First and foremost, as you're thinking about your health coaching, think, please, please think about your insurance and think about your licensing requirements and like what background you have to do this. Um, and I'm not saying don't do it. It's something you need to plan for. Uh, and then when you're talking about reputational risks, those are obvious because you're online. Um, things spread like wildfire online. So those are all of your reviews that you're asking for, all of the groups that you're a part of and how I'm assuming a lot of, a lot of my health coaches work on Facebook. Um, what would happen if somebody went into the Facebook group that you're a part of, that you're getting clients from and said negative things? Um, and how would you deal with that sort of situation? Are you diverse enough across different platforms and different lead sources to continue operating your business if one goes awry on you, right? That's important. Um, financial risks are all the things that we've already talked about. Just like any other business, you need to be able to manage your cash flow. You have to have a plan for what your expenses are going to be. They need to include things like your insurance, like your technology. I know it seems like an online business. You, I think, I think a mis common misconception is that an online business requires no startup costs. That's not true. To be successful online and to really protect yourself, you still need the basic foundational things that all businesses need. Um, and I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot, a lot. Um, actually, I had someone come to me last week who not, not health coaching necessarily, but it's more like an online life coaching business. And they were just threatened with a lawsuit. Now they want insurance. It doesn't work like that. Like, unfortunately you can't get insurance after the thing happens. Um, 
and they just jumped into it, right? They did an online life coaching program. They started taking some clients and it didn't go well. So just be aware of those types of things. And I think that's going to be unique to every industry that's going to come up in these types of conversations too, right? So it's really hard for me to be general about it, but there are certain things that every business needs to be aware of and financial risks. Um, all of these are applicable to every industry. Just how they get applied is going to be a little bit different depending on what someone's doing. I, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> I think you did. I think okay. you did. That was, that was helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, you know, here's the other thing, you guys, at the end of this, um, my contact information is all here. So I really just encourage you guys to reach out to us. We can have these strategy sessions with you that are really relevant to what you're particularly like what you're working on, as opposed to like a generic conversation. Um, okay. So we talked about some of the methods that you can use to lower or eliminate the risk that you're facing. Um, and these things can be applied to operations, to your strategic management, insurance plays a role in this, loss control and safety. These are all human resources management. These are all things, areas that you can, um, that you can employ to reduce the risk that you came up with in your risk map, okay? So there's op things you can do operationally. There's things you can do with your team and your people definitely loss control and safety. There are some things that are insurable and then some things that will get addressed just from strategic management. Okay, so let's just take an example just so everybody can kind of see what this looks like from start to finish. So if you guys remember on our heat map, these were two things that were very severe and very likely or already occurring, right? Um, we have data breach, we have past due accounts receivable, re receivables and we have key employee departures. What we're going to focus on for our example is just these past due account receivables. So let's say that this is an issue in your business. Let's go through all of the things that you could do to try to address this. So you could say, I'm going to accept this. That doesn't seem like a good solution because these guys are not going to be able to manage their cash flow. You could say, I'm going to transfer this risk to someone else. Maybe that, that could be a potential, um, potential method, right? You could say, I'm gonna reduce the, I reduce the likelihood of this happening. That seems, that seems like a good potential scenario. I'm not gonna eliminate it because I need to sell things and I need to have accounts receivable, right? Um, and then I, obviously advisory, you can ask other people who have been in the situation, your expert advisors. But so in terms of reduction, operational improvements will dramatically impact this, okay? So we could th think about things like ordering credit checks before we extend payment terms. Maybe, maybe we're not, we're extending credit to people we shouldn't be. We can think about implementing a terms and conditions agreement. That's a contractual risk transfer, right? We can think about instituting a credit limit so that no one past due account receivable can completely screw up my ability to fulfill new orders, right? Um, maybe we're not doing a great job with our invoicing and our collections. So we can look at implementing more of an automated system or potentially hiring someone to do that, outsourcing it for us. Um, is it feasible to require payments in full before you fulfill orders to eliminate this issue? So these are all ideas of operational improvements that may impact this past due accounts receivable issue, which is a very common, very common issue in the businesses I work with. Um, some other things, you can investigate working capital. So short-term lending is helpful in these situations when you need to draw a small amount of money so you can continue to fulfill orders while you're waiting for your past due accounts receivable. It's not something that you wanna rely on. It's more of an emergency thing, but access to working capital can help in these situations, right? Um, and then the other thing is you can consider accounts receivable insurance. So all of these things in combination together, finding your operational um, improvements, right? What is it that's really causing this and how do we address it oper operationally? Finding additional working capital or maintaining additional working capital, right? Maybe you can do it in your business currently. Um, and then investigating accounts receivable insurance. Collectively, all of those things may address your past due accounts receivable issues. So you can continue to fulfill orders and have less pressure on your cash flow. Um, there are plenty of other things we could do about this, but the idea here is that you have a problem in your business you identify what the root cause is, you have a risk in your business, you identify what the root cause is, and then we come up with what we could do to address those risks using what we know works, acceptance, transfer, reduction. Um, 
to lower the impact to our business. And we can't eliminate this risk, but we can work with it and we can lower the impact, negative impact that it has on our business, right? So um, that's the idea. That's kind of just like a simplistic example of how you look at a risk and you say, how can I address this? Um, and you might find too, that one of these things is enough. Again, depending on your risk tolerance and what you have going on as a business, you may just want accounts receivable insurance so that you can sleep better knowing that your, if your main client goes out of business, you've got something to fall back on. You still need to diversify your clients and you need to diversify your revenue streams, but it's at least a stopgap for now, right? So you can have a short-term and a long-term plan. Um, I'm gonna pause there. I know we're up on time. What questions does everybody have? So Meredith, I see one more question in the chat we probably have time for. Uh, you talked about the advisory team. Uh, this mm -hmm. person asked, what role do you, Meredith, play in the advisory role based on the recommendations you just mentioned? And do you help people connect to other resources if they don't have them, i.e. finding a lawyer to make sure all their bases are covered? Yes. Yeah. So what we do as a firm is we function mainly on the operational and human resources side, but for risks that fall in other areas like your legal risks, your accounting risks, we have a team of expert advisors that we work with and we curate them based on what your business need is. So you can think of us as sort of like an outsourced management team. You don't have the need for a full-time management team right now, or maybe the cash flow necessarily, but we'll do that work for you. So we'll bring um, a vetted accountant that we've worked with in the past. We'll bring a vetted strategic advisor. Maybe you have questions on raising capital. I've got a person for that. They're an expert in that. That's what they do. They talk about capital options. Um, so we curate that network for you, depending on what your business needs and kind of serve it up to you. So you don't have to do the legwork of finding the people and vetting them and then organizing them. So we kind of project manage that for you. Um, we handle all of the HR stuff and all of the operational things and a little bit of the accounting, like in terms of like accounting system setups and processes. We don't do bookkeeping or things like that, but yeah, it's a good That's question. Great. So we're, uh, we're over time here. We should probably wrap it up here. Meredith, mm -hmm. where can uh, everyone learn more about you and your business? Okay, so one thing I want you guys to take away is please don't let the session go to waste. Um, you spent an hour of your time here. I really want you guys to think about what was that one thing you can take away from this presentation and then what will it do for you or your business if you're able to implement it? And then just do something with it, right? Because time is the only resource we can't replace and you spent some here, so do something with it. That's all. That would make me feel really happy if everybody just did one thing um, based on this. Okay, so we've got a couple of things. You guys can go to insuregood.org, um, navigate to the small business services page, which is here, and you can do like a self-evaluation of your business. So it's just a quick 30 second or 30 question quiz, and we'll return some suggestions to you in areas you can focus on. It's meant more as like a self-awareness thing, not so much a, a here are all the consulting points. Um, certainly, you can follow us for events and resources and community. You can join our email list. We have lots of tools and resources and events that we're rolling out all the time that are designed to help small business owners. Um, and all of our social handles are there. So um, my information is readily available on the website and every social media channel there is. And you guys can feel free to reach out to me whatever way you're comfortable with, wherever you're comfortable with it, because I'm in all the places. Great. Meredith, thank you so much. This is very informative. I really appreciate it. You've got Meredith's information here. Um, we'll get a recording out to everybody um, so you can uh, re revisit this content if you like. And if you're interested in learning more about SCORE, uh, you can go to SCORE.org. You can sign up for mentoring services there. Uh, you can uh, sign up for a workshop or a webinar, and you can consult with our resource library. And once again, all of our services are free. So thanks again to everyone for joining today, and uh, good luck with everything. Take care. Thanks, guys.